Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on Beyond Eating and Exercise, Implementing Trauma-Informed Obesity Care in SBHCs. Thank you so much for attending our conference. I have a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. I'd like to remind everyone that the conference sessions are being recorded and they will be available on Hublo through the end of October and as well as on our website beginning next week. Uh, slides will be shared after the conference and you can engage with these presenters using our chat function and you can ask questions using the Q&A button. Uh, we will be taking some time both throughout the presentation and some time at the end of the pres presentation to be answering questions. Um, and we are also collecting evaluations. So please uh, respond to the email asking for you to send out an evaluation and they will also be available on the conference feed uh, for the chance to be entered in our raffle. All right, let's get started. Uh, Victoria. Thank you, Haley. Good morning, everyone. I'm Victoria Keaton. I am a pediatric nurse practitioner and a clinical professor at the University of California in San Francisco in the pediatric nurse practitioner program. Um, I'm a, a clinician in a school-based center, health center through La Clinica de la Raza, uh, one of the large clinic organizations um, here in the Bay Area. And I've been there for about eight years. Um, I also, in my um, previous clinical practice, was the uh, coordinator of a weight and uh, lifestyle management clinic for San Francisco General's uh, County Pediatric Clinic uh, for about five years. And uh, we're really looking forward to talking with you this morning. So I'll let uh, Naomi introduce herself. Hi, I'm Naomi Shapiro, and I am a, a retired professor of nursing at UCSF. I'm um, still pretty active doing research around um, uh, ACEs and uh, also unaccompanied immigrant youth. I'm also a pediatric nurse practitioner and have been uh, at La Clinica on and off for a very long time in the most recent stints, about 10 years at San Lorenzo High School Health Center, which is one of the um, many health centers, school-based health centers run by La Clinica. Great, thanks Naomi. Um, so just to start, um, we do not have um, any disclosures or conflicts of interest to share. Um, just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about this morning, uh, we will talk a little bit about physiology and the impact of stress, particularly on weight and metabolic health. Uh, and then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about our sort of traditional models of uh, obesity, either prevention or intervention, and what is working and maybe not working in those uh, approaches. And then we'll talk a little bit about new ideas, um, more innovations, and what we have tried to do in our school-based health centers as well. Um, just to let you know, we did uh, do a version of this talk last year at the national convention. So if any of you were there, um, we have you know, done some updates, but some of this uh, might be a little bit of a repeat, but um, we, we look forward to also sharing a little bit more of the work that we've done since that point. Um, so as Haley mentioned, please put your questions in the chat as you have them and we'll pause as we go along to address them. So let's start uh, talking a little bit about um, you know, the concepts of over overweight and obesity in youth overall. And I like to call this kind of rewriting the narrative because I think often in these types of talks, we, talk, we start with statistics and we start talking about you know, sort of how grave everything is and, and the epidemics that we've seen in this particular area of healthcare. And so I'd like to um, shift that a little bit and um, know that you know, we all know that this is uh, an issue all over the globe and especially in this country and try and focus a little bit more on um, where we can perhaps take more action. So the first thing I really want to get um, sort of cleared up is the idea that you know, for many, many years people have equated elevated BMI or a body mass index you know, over the 85th percentile, over the 95th percentile with things like obesity. And while those may be clinical definitions used particularly like for billing or you know, diagnostic purposes, 
they're actually not the same thing. So the, the definition, true definition of obesity is excessive growth and expansion of adipocytes or fat cells in the body. Um, and when we look specifically at adipose tissue, there are definitely you know, two kinds of fat tissue that we're most concerned about. One is subcutaneous, and the one that is a little bit more concerning is, is visceral fat, right? Which is the one that we tie much more closely to metabolic or cardiovascular uh, health outcomes. Uh, but L, uh, body mass index is, is very specifically a calculation. It looks at weight for height, and that's about it. And it has no way of accounting for the different types of adiposity in the body, or even muscle mass for that matter. So it's a very crude measurement. Um, it's one that has, is very easy to gather. Um, it's fairly uh, minimally invasive. Uh, it you know, has virtually no cost. And so it has become the way that we have sort of addressed and measured this concept over many, many years. However, it is very flawed, right? The BMI was created as a population health tool, right? It was meant to be looking at large groups and tying you know, these sort of numbers to potential health outcomes. But it has been inappropriately then been used to attribute to individual plans of care. And that has, has become pro problematic over time. Um, it is also a tool that reflects um, a, a very, you know, sort of old fashioned and limited body of people, mostly adults, mostly white men. Um, so not representative of the diverse populations and certainly um, even less so of youth in this country. So I don't, you know, we, we don't spend a lot of time being sort of down on the BMI, but I, I do wanna, I think it's important to set up that framework of, of why we need to start kind of maybe shifting a little bit away of, of discussing BMI as the ultimate outcome or the ultimate measure of success when we're talking about uh, this type of issue. Uh, this study, I think, does a, a really fabulous job of kind of demonstrating this, the example. Uh, this is actually a study of adults, but they actually looked at both um, BMI and waist circumference of individuals and then also did uh, imaging to look at the actual adiposity inside the body. And so if you look here, these are two individuals in the top row who had the exact same body fat percentage, same BMI, same waist circumference. But when you look on the inside at the amount of visceral fat, they had very, very different profiles. And so theoretically, if we go by the fact that visceral fat is really more predictive of um, negative health outcomes, we would see that, see that the individual on the right is far more at risk than the individual on the left. But as a clinician, if this patient you know, came in and I was only looking at their BMI, I might treat them very much the same. And, and that would be inappropriate in sort of a, a patient-centered model. Um, and then same thing here on the bottom. So uh, this is kind of, you know, the, the biggest question of the day, right? Is it this simple? For many, many years, this was the interpretation. It's just a calories problem. If we just eat less and exercise more, then we will maintain our weight and there'll be no problem. Well, that way of thinking has not gotten us very far. And in fact, we've gone, you know, gotten even worse over time. So we have, you know, over the last uh, decade or so, paid more attention to the fact that this is a multifactorial issue. There must be more than just calorie balance going on. And so this is kind of a nice overview of where the research has uh, looked at potential contributors to weight gain and metabolic health. Uh, we know that it starts very early on, even before uh, birth it, with genetics. And, and now we know a little bit more about epigenetics. Um, there are concerns about the prenatal environment and exposures within the prenatal environment that can also impact uh, later uh, weight and health. Uh, postnatal environment, even everything from just, you know, sort of child rearing practices, feeding practices in the home to, um, to stress as well. And then diet and physical activity we know the most about. And then mental health and social determinants. And this is, I think, the area where we're uh, focusing a little bit more, thankfully, and, um, and is where we'll talk a lot about today. So what is interesting is that even though we have a wide body of literature that shows that there are so many different contributors to uh, weight gain um, and metabolic outcomes, yet the majority of our interventions continue to focus in this area down here. So time and time again, when we see studies about you know, obesity interventions, they are often very focused on 
changing diet, changing physical activity, or often even more so educating about these areas. And if we only do this in a siloed environment and ignore all of these contributors, we're not going to be moving the needle. And that's exactly what we've been seeing over time. So if we look particularly at the intervention literature to see sort of how we're doing, are these things working? Um, and again, there have been you know, countless studies looking particularly in youth at whether diet and physical activity interventions are effective. And many of them, you know, if you're looking at BMI as your outcome, uh, many of them do show a small BMI de decrease for a short period of time. Very few studies have shown long lasting change, again, particularly if we're looking at BMI. So, uh, so this you know, doesn't seem to be the most effective way to be moving the needle, particularly in this area. Um, the problem is not a lot of these studies are really large um, and really robust in their methodology. So there is difficulty in the ability to generalize our results and apply them to other populations. Um, also, the intervention literature has shown that you know, the dose effect, sort of how often patients need to interact with their um, providers or with the person running the intervention is quite frequent, at least one hour a week for at least six months. So as we know, the ability to retain participants in that type of intervention is really challenging. So when we're doing a study, when we end up looking at our final results, we end up with this pool of people who stuck with it. And that may not necessarily be a generalizable population. So again, limitations in the research itself might contribute to you know, the overall picture and, and the assumptions that we're making. Uh, some of the positives that we've seen is that metabolic change seems to actually occur even before or without BMI change. And when we're thinking long term about out health outcomes and uh, life expectancy, that is a promising thing. We do want metabolic health to, to improve. Um, and so it's, it's a, a good reminder that maybe this is an area we should be focusing a little more on uh, rather than BMI. Um, the research in diverse populations and particularly in socioeconomically underserved populations uh, is, is less uh, promising and less, even just less prevalent. So the ability to really make generalizable uh, 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 claims from the, the results to this population is limited. Um, and then the other overall component that we see time and time again is that family involvement is really, really important in any type of lifestyle intervention. And, um, and when we're talking about school-based health, school health specifically, it's an important thing to think about. So um, today we'll focus a little bit more on the sort of everything else, right? So we know kind of what diet and physical activity are doing. So um, we would like to, to think a little bit about the bigger picture, right? We, so many interventions focus on the individual when ignoring that there's a larger structure and system behind them that is absolutely impacting their ability to make lifestyle choices and to, to be successful in any behavior change. So this would be things like food and housing insecurity, um, uh, racial discrimination, structural inequities, um, and even simple mental health, right? The ability to cope with the, the many stressors that are present in life and that we'll talk in just a moment about how they affect weight and metabolic health. Particular to social determinants, thinking about, you know, our youth sort of, where, what is their marketplace? Where are they getting food? And for many youth, particularly in underserved areas, it is not necessarily in the healthiest of environments, even their school environment, which is where a lot of children get their food sources for at least breakfast and lunch, don't have a lot of great options or don't, um, don't prefer, you know, the options that are available to them. Uh, they may live in food deserts or areas where there's not a lot of fresh or um, healthy food available to them. They may not be in safe uh, environments or built environments that reflect or promote physical activity, even in just everyday life. They are um, susceptible now to media even more so than ever before. We used to be so focused on uh, you know, commercials and TV, and now social media has just kind of exploded. And so the, both with body image and satisfaction and sort of comparison uh, to what's out there in social media, and then also negative advertising. Um, lobbies, food lobbies play a big role in this. Our, you know, national recommendations and guidelines are, can often be influenced by food lobbies. And so we have to consider that when we're thinking about what's out there. And then finally, uh, public policy, right? So the overall system is is absolutely affected by the laws uh, that govern and and that you know make uh, health uh, 
uh, healthcare either more accessible or more limited to some people. Um, and then finally, behavioral health. So the research really shows that this, there's a bi-directional relationship in a lot of these, um, with a lot of these uh, factors. So everything from body image to mental health issues like depression and anxiety, trauma, bullying, eating disorders. Uh, some of them have been shown to contribute to uh, increased weight gain, and some of them have been shown to be the result of increased weight gain. So we have plenty of evidence that shows us that we need to be working on these areas. So in a moment, we'll talk a little bit about um, stress and how that plays into it, but I'm going to pause here for our first sort of set of questions. Haley, do we have any questions from the chat that we should address? We do not have any more questions at this time, so we can move on. Okay, great. So I'll turn it over to Naomi. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about stress and its uh, impact on obesity and, and also metabolic changes that are, have been related to obesity in the literature. Okay. Um, so one thing uh, we wanted to talk a lot about is toxic stress because in a lot of the literature that has accumulated um, about say adverse childhood experiences and other kinds of stresses, um, the kind of unremitting stress, prolonged stress, uh, and especially stress without the ability to buffer have been associated with excess cortisol. And uh, there are a lot of ways we'll talk about in a minute that that contributes to weight gain uh, and to metabolic changes. And when we talk about metabolic changes, we're talking about things like elevated lipids and elevated blood sugar, insulin resistance, things like that. Um, so toxic stress, the classic definition is that it results from strong, frequent or prolonged activation of the body's stress response system in the absence of the buffering protection of a supportive relationship. Or and this is kind of my addition or our addition is that there may be a very supportive family figure. We, you know, I think this can sometimes lead to blaming the parent or blaming the family, and it's really that sometimes the level and persistence of type of stress and trauma overwhelms even the most supportive parent, um, and so then the buffering is, you know, is not as effective as it could be, and we, the family really needs a lot more support than they may be get, getting. Excuse me. So in terms of the long-term effects of toxic stress. We're looking at changes in the brain. We're looking at altered neuroendocrine responses to stress, altered size and function of brain centers, and biological disruptions that increase the predisposition to chronic diseases of adulthood. And particularly, we're talking about type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease here. But also other diseases of adulthood. So for those of you who've been following literature on adverse childhood experiences, um, they've also shown that they're in uh, increases in really all kinds of chronic conditions, not just these. Um, so in terms of ACEs and health outcomes, uh, there's an association between uh, the ACEs score, just kind of minimizing my screen, sorry, um, graded relationship between the ACE score and cardiovascular disease. And you can see, um, for those of you who are not super familiar with this, um, ACEs are kind of 10 measures of household dysfunction that are, were first uh, noted in a Kaiser study back in the 90s. And um, you can score from one, zero to 10. Um, and then these look at uh, the, higher, the higher the dose of adverse experiences, the higher the level of cardiovascular disease. And for children, um, in, in terms of these adverse experiences, uh, which are one form of toxic stress, we know epidemiologically that there's a relationship between what happens in childhood and adult diseases, but people have just begun really to study in depth what's going on with children. So this is a study from 2013. It was a population level study of children in sixth grade, sixth to eighth grade in Ontario. And they um, measured these kind of blood pressure, heart rate, BMI, and waist circumference and they also gave the parents a questionnaire about adverse childhood experiences. And you can see there's also a dose-dependent relationship here uh, between the average uh, number of ACEs and the average body mass index, um, and then also waist circumference, which uh, 
is also not perfect, but people think of that as more of, of a measure of uh, central adiposity. Now this study is actually has been combined with other childhood studies and now there's a longitudinal study into young adulthood that's underway to see if these changes persist and what can be done about them. So in terms of how stress does affect the body, um, we talked about increased cortisol, uh, which leads to a persistent elevation of glucose while inhibiting insulin. So more glucose in the body and more resistance to insulin or more inhibition of insulin production, which could handle that. Uh, increased appetite. So um, people talk about stress eating a lot. Um, and we've talked about that even more during the pandemic. And so comfort foods, we think about things that are sweet and salty, um, are very appealing and provide some short-term relief of stress. Um, stress, this increased cortisol increases the visceral fat storage and also uh, desensitized um, about leptin. So leptin actually controls appetite. Uh, and so if that is that kind of appetite sensor is desensitized, then we may feel hungry all the time, even if we have actually enough food in our bodies at the moment. So um, what's being done about that? Um, and just this graphic is just to denote that sometimes uh, when we actually decide that there's a solution to a problem, we can sometimes create a new problem. Uh, so one measure that's been used in California and widely across the country is to require classroom and PE measurements of BMI. So uh, if you actually typically, if you require that a particular grade is measured, um, say in middle school, um, typically the most effective way to do that is in the gym class. And it might be just like this. It might be kids lining up and seeing their each other's weight and waist measurements. Um, so um, this can lead to a lot of weight shaming. Um, the thought was that, you know, behind this was if we could increase awareness of BMI and families were aware that their kids' body mass index was, was rising and their waist circumference was rising, maybe they would quote unquote do something about it. Um, and so uh, the, typically the kids would be measured, maybe in private, maybe in public, and a letter would be sent home to parents. Um, and there's been a lot of research about the effects of the letters. And um, with some positive, but, but primarily some negative effects of having these letters sent home. Um, and there hasn't really been the outcome of suddenly a, a decrease in BMI or waist circumference. So uh, another thing we think about is does weighing help? Um, and there are some studies in adults who are specifically trying to lose weight, often for health related uh, issues that self weighing can be associated with weight loss. Uh, but studies in younger populations, so children, teens, do not show the same results. Uh, in fact, the frequent weighing may reduce self-efficacy, may contribute to stigma or neg negative psychological outcomes. Um, and there's even some uh, thoughts that excess weighing can contribute to some disordered eating or eating disorders, um, and that a lot more research is needed about this in adolescence. Um, we've also seen the stigmatization of weight. So um, there's a societal devaluation due to overweight. There are harmful stereotypes, you know, including lack of willpower or discipline. Um, you know, I've heard people, um, even in the classes that I teach, and I teach nurse practitioner students, coming in and saying, oh, I saw this person in the grocery store, and they were really overweight, and they were just throwing, um, you know, junk food into their cart, and how can people do this, you know, and, you know, that was not a study of what everybody was throwing into their cart in the grocery store. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of blaming the victim uh, on stigmatization of weight. Um, and this is not just perpetuated by peers and educators or students, it's also healthcare professionals. We have contributed to this. Um, and um, we associate higher BMI weight, higher BMI with unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, when in fact, the person that we're seeing who has a high BMI might actually be eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, getting enough sleep, feeling pretty happy if we weren't bothering them in the, in the clinic and uh, engaging in a lot of exercise. And we have no way to know that because often the way we treat folks with a higher BMI does not lead to them actually having a good dialogue or conversation with us. Um, actually, just wanted to go back in here while we're on this slide. Um, as Victoria talked about, um, the whole BMI measurement was developed as a, a population measure in which the uh, population that was being compared to all others were Northern and Western European white men. So um, 
their BMI was seen to be preferable to say Southern and Eastern Europeans or to uh, folks from Africa, Asia, and other continents. So uh, in a way, we're also perpetuating racial stereotypes by this kind of stigmatization of weight. Um, so the potential health impact of weight stigma, negative mental health outcomes, increased isolation. People don't come back for more health care if they feel like they're going to be lectured or treated in a way that feels bad to them. Uh, a negative effect on work in school. Um, there's a fair number of studies that show that people who are perceived as who are slender um, actually progress better in the, work, the workforce, um, do better in school than kids with higher BMIs or adults, increase in unhealthy eating behaviors, lower levels of physical activity. Often people who are ashamed about their body do less exercise because of that, and then therefore worsening obesity with a worse cardiovascular and other chronic disease outcomes. So um, maybe the way we frame this is the problem. Is it possible to address healthy diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction without asking our patients to lose weight? So I'm going to pause here and uh, stop sharing. And then this is a good time if there are some questions for us to answer them. Yes, we do have some questions. I'm going to start with if BMI is not meant to be utilized to assess an individual's health and wellness, why do we continue to utilize weight, weight gain, and obesity as measures of health? A good question. Yeah. Um, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that? <laughs> um, well, I want to answer just sort of a, that weight gain can, can uh, weight loss can be a measure of um, it could also be a measure of fluid overload and other kinds of things. So we're not just necessarily measuring body fat when we measure weight, but I'm going to let Victoria answer that, the rest of that. So it's a, it's a great question and comment sort of all wrapped into one. And it's, so some of it is, you know, what I referred to earlier is the fact that it's easy and cheap, right? And we, when we think about clinical, you know, screening tools and diagnostic tools, we often go towards what is the easiest thing to do, what is the least invasive to the patient, um, and what won't incur a lot of costs. And so BMI is one of those things. From a population standpoint, it does have some value. The, the fact that elevated BMI has been tied to morbidity and mortality on a population level is still true, right? Those things are not untrue. So, you know, overall it provides some information, but it really should not be used at the individual level. So what is most important and what we're going to talk about next is really our focus on, you know, lifestyle intervention, right? And so lifestyle can contribute to weight gain and more importantly, contributes to a lot more negative health outcomes. And so that's really our end game is that we want to improve everybody's health physically and mentally, then we should really be, you know, focused on what's sort of getting them there. So I, I think a lot of it is history. You know, I was trained in the way of that BMI was the tool we used and it and I pulled up my BMI chart with every patient I saw. And it wasn't really and for me until I was in practice for many, many years, particularly with populations who have been marginalized and sort of unfairly and disproportionately affected uh, by a lot of these issues that I really started to question the fact of weight. There must be something else here and, sh and can we really think about this differently? So, you know, I wish I had a better answer, but I think a lot of it is, you know, some of it is that sort of ease of use and cost and a lot of it is just, it's what we've always done. And I think the fact that you're all here today gives us hope that we can start to, to change practice a little bit. Next question, Haley. Thank you. The next question we have is, I want to know how to bring up concerns regarding weight with the child and the parents. It's such a sensitive topic. It's a good question. Um, I could say something about that. I think what I do is say that, um, that the body mass index has been associated with health issues. And so what we like to do, what I like to do with families, if I'm worried about a child and, um, and the child's health, and especially if there's a family history of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, is I say like, you know, this, this is a pretty imperfect measure. What we like to do um, is to see if 
there are, you know, look at your child's blood pressure. Let's see if we can actually do some blood tests and look and see, you know, what, how is your child's insulin levels or, you know, we usually do uh, fasting glucose if we can or BMI or um, hemoglobin A1C and, and look at lipids. And so let's look and see if there are any biological markers um, that might indicate that your child is more at risk for developing chronic disease. And so I kind of do it at like, you know, this is a very crude measure of a risk for chronic disease. Um, and it's really not about the weight, it's just the opportunity for us to see, is your child currently at risk? And often if parents have high blood pressure and have uh, type two diabetes, or, you know, there is that in their family, they're really pretty happy to have their kids screened. Uh, to make sure to see how much their kid is at risk. And then I think that can drive, you know, some of the issues and stuff like that. I think we also want to do it in the context of um, having done psychosocial assessments, you know, especially for teens so doing something like a shades or, you know, having a kind of holistic measure. So that when we talk about it, we're not just talking about weight, we're talking about other issues. Um, you know, if there is a sudden weight gain, like, is there something else that's going on or sudden weight loss? Is there something going on? the child or family. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that, you know, if we think about patient-centered care, motivational interviewing, the idea of starting with the patient, right? And so if the parent is the one who's bringing the concern, you know, I'm concerned about my child's weight, then I will ask why, right? So what is your concern about that? And see where they take it. So if, they're, if they take it directly to, well, I try to serve healthy food and they won't eat it, then that's where we go and we focus on you know, nutrition content and, and ideas for, for changing diet, which is not the focus on weight, right? It's the focus on the actual, you know, behavior or lifestyle. If they take it to, well, you know, kids are making fun of him at school or he's getting bullied, then we delve into the mental health aspect of it, right? So the idea is really trying to, you know, indirectly kind of shape the conversations so that the focus ends up being on, you know, lifestyle supports that we know will affect numerous indicators in health not just weight and maybe not weight, right? Um, and then the other idea is if it's, if they don't express concern and I'm concerned, right? And then I have to check my own, am I bringing an agenda to this appointment, right? And inserting my own concerns, but then I do my, my normal history taking, right? And in my history taking, I am assessing nutrition content, active, physical activity, time and sedentary activity and sleep. And if any of those things bring up some concerns that can contribute toward health, then that's where I will go. So I notice that, you know, you're staying up until two in the morning playing games. There's some really recent research that shows, you know, that that can relate to this, this, and this. What do you think about that, right? And kind of going there. So I really have tried to sort of steer the conversation away from weight specifically, um, but use it as an entry point, like Naomi's saying, like this is information that gives us a door open to a bigger conversation and then sort of allowing having that collaborative process where the patient and family are able to kind of focus on something that's important to them as well. Can I say one more thing about that is, is that typically before I even like look up the vital signs when I'm talking to adolescents in particular I'll usually say to them um, I'd like to know how you feel about your weight are you happy with your weight or do you want to gain or lose and because I don't want to privilege losing weight there, you know, sometimes people actually that I would think of, you know, in my whatever prejudiced mind, because we've all grown up with the stereotypes of thin being healthier, I think, oh, they seem like pretty healthy and they want to gain weight, you know, finding out what that is for. And also then I ask what they're doing, if they're doing anything like they're doing any dieting or they're not eating, or I actually even ask teens specifically if they're trying to make themselves throw up or have diarrhea to lose weight. And it's kind of amazing like how people will just tell me what's really going on there. And so, you know, I've already started out opening that door to kind of how they feel about it. And that's pretty early on in the visit. And we will talk a little bit more about sort of body positivity and, and different ways to approach this from a, a trauma informed lens. But do we, um, are there any other questions? I think we, maybe we can do one more and then we'll just move on and hold them to the end. Sure. Okay, one question that I think is relevant what can we do to assist students and families when cortisol reduction, with cortisol reduction, when many of their cortisol release triggers are ingrained in social determinants of health? 
Ah, yes, great question. So, you know, I think the the short answer to that is, you know, there are things that we need are going to need to do on a structural level that are very big picture, right? And so that's in our role of kind of advocacy and enforcing systems change, policy change, um, things like that, 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 right? We can't, I mean, as individuals or even small communities, it's going to be very difficult to drive the needle if we're not making strides in that area as well. So I think that that's one component of it. Um, I do think there is some research to support um, the buffering of stress. And so the fact that there are people who are going to be exposed to chronic stress, you know, you know for, for no matter what we try, and that that doesn't mean that there's, you know, a sort of morbidity sentence for them and that there's nothing they can do. And so some of what we'll talk about in a moment is about also introducing strategies for coping and stress management that may actually be able to start to mitigate some of those physiologic processes that we discussed earlier. Naomi, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I just, I totally agree. And I think having, you know, on your, uh, you know, in your home screen or when we go back to in-person care on your desktop, having just some coping skills that are just like right there, you can say, you know, would you like to practice? muscle relaxation, or would you like to talk about visualization? Just having something that you can hand them uh, as a coping skill to kind of decrease the stress level in the moment. People really appreciate that. Yeah, and it's, it's a great, that's actually a really great segue sort of into the next section of, you know, so we've talked about what's being done about it and what, what the issues are. So let's talk a little bit about maybe what we can do about it and, and specifically what we've um, tried at our health centers. So, um, so we do want to introduce kind of a, the framework that we've used of trauma-informed care. Um, and so for those of you not familiar, so, you know, the idea really being that in the past, when patients came in with, you know, a problem or we sort of identified a problem, uh, there was often this, you know, this very blaming type approach of kind of what's wrong with you. And then we moved into a little bit more of a space of understanding the fact that there are a lot of contributors, um, that this is not necessarily an individual blame type issue. And um, so maybe we need more of the story. And so what happened to you? And then now sort of moving that into also incorporating the idea of strengths-based approaches, right? So that we can get very stuck in this negative place of in talking about trauma or, um, you know, uh, stressful experiences that are happening. And um, let's also talk about what's right. And not every uh, student or child who has experienced trauma or is experiencing trauma uh, is necessarily having poor health outcomes. And let's Let's open that up, right? Let's not pathologize people before it sort of come out. So let's really also talk about what's going right with them, focus on some of the strengths, and work together in the direction that um, that you both, you know, all together feel is important. So we took the trauma-informed kind of lens and applied that specifically to, you know, quote unquote, weight management or uh, intervention type visits. And so the four R's is one of um, the uh, sort of models pro promoted by um, uh, SAMHSA with the uh, mental, National Mental Health Organizations. And so we've sort of adapted it and applied it uh, to this particular topic. So starting with, you know, kind of uh, this realization, right? So uh, together, and part of this can be education, but also is really just kind of building a safety and an open space for us all to talk about the fact that there are other things contributing to weight beyond diet and exercise. Um, many youth are surprised to hear this or are interested to actually have the conversation open up to these other parts of their lives and think about it in a little bit of a different way. Uh, recognizing uh, that there are symptoms of stress that we know, signs and symptoms of stress that um, maybe either students are not paying attention to them th themselves or that, you know, we as practitioners are noticing. So helping both youth um, and their families really start to think about, are there symptoms of stress that they're exhibiting that might be contributing to the issue? Um, so really promoting self-awareness and also uh, intuitive uh, practices of eating and wellness. So really the, the questions of kind of why do we do what we do? How do we feel while we do what we do, right? So really probing into that as opposed to just the, the sort of lecturing of like, you should be doing this, right? Um, resisting the, the temptation to re-traumatize, and this is really significant, and this goes towards the piece that Naomi was discussing about some of these interventions that we have come up with that might have been making the problem worse. And so weight, you know, frequent weighing is, is one of those things. So can we consider having a patient come in for an appointment and not weighing them, or have them have the choice of whether they are weighed, right? So 
given that what we have presented and how much information we have about the fact that weight should not be our final outcome, why are we continuing to do this, this type of you know, measurement that can be so stigmatizing and triggering for so many youth? Um, and then considering the whole environment. So the language that you use and both in interactions with patients, but also in your documentation, there have been really interesting studies looking at medical charts and the way that, that practitioners describe patients in this very stigmatizing and um, you know, even borderline offensive uh, way. So really thinking about language, thinking about the clinic environment, are the posters that you have in your clinics and the brochures that you're giving out or the patient handouts, are they reflective of body diversity and body positivity? And if not, how can we change that? And, and on a school level, how can we talk with our school about doing the same? And then responding, right? So really taking all of this information and then really putting them together in an inter intervention that is absolutely patient driven. So collaborating together with the patient and family and then is as holistic as possible. So considering both their social needs and determinants and their mental health needs. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has also come out, you know, in support of body positivity. Um, and so that some of the recommendations that they have that go in line with this are that uh, clinicians have an absolute responsibility to role model supportive and unbiased behavior. And so this, this also gets at the fact that, you know, some of the shaming and stigmatization can happen within families. And so if we are um, talking with the youth together with their parents, that our role modeling of positive, you know, conversations and discussions and positive language can be influential to the families as well. Um, and then uh, the AAP also recommends integrated behavioral health, that really we are at a point where we understand that the two are so intertwined that in order to provide the best uh, care for patients, we really should be looking at them both physiologically and from a mental health standpoint. Uh, there are some studies that have looked more specifically at, you know, if we start to focus on body positivity and less on BMI and weight, uh, do we see change? And uh, many of the initial results are very encouraging. Um, so again, it, not necessarily any BMI change, but we've already discussed the fact that that might not be necessary, but that um, lifestyle habits change, eating habits and activity habits can change. Uh, adolescents can feel more self-efficacy, more empowered, better self-esteem, have improved mental health outcomes if they start to feel comfortable within their own bodies, not judged and stigmatized, and also have a better concept of why, you know, health change can be significant to them beyond the scale. Uh, a kind of a large sort of movement and also, you know, research area in the adult population has been um, the health at every size, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, this is something that was created by a, a researcher, a nutritionist um, and exercise physiologist who developed this platform, but really based in uh, many of the ideas are, you know, um, that we need to get away from right weight as our final outcome, that many of the studies that report you know, weight and BMI as this negative health outcome are either biased or um, have you know, inappropriate research methodology, um, that there are lots of socioeconomic factors that impact um, uh, you know, those, those studies and their findings, and that mental health also is a huge piece of this. And that if we actually stop focusing on restrictive dieting and you know, increased exercise and things like that, which are not maybe natural pathways for patients, that we end up making, either making the problem worse or certainly not improving it. But if people take a step back, focus more on their own comfort with their body, um, appreciate and have more um, you know, self-esteem and start to focus on things like mindful eating and, and intu intuitive eating practices, that their actually lifestyle change is more sustainable, long periods, regardless of whether their weight changes or not. So not um, all of this has been studied in youth. Um, this has mostly been looked at in adults, but we're starting to see a little bit more interest in this direction. Um, one of, uh, uh, oh, I think I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide, but um, some of the things I think that we can take from the HAES movement is really this idea of you know, shifting our, our lean on BMI and weight as our main thing. And I know there are probably lots of clinicians out there watching this right now that are thinking, what? Like, you know, kind of like, how am I supposed to stop doing what I've been doing this whole time and change? And it's a process. This, you know, this is something that might take a little bit. Um, but I, I do hope that we're at least providing you 
uh, food for thought, excuse the pun. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and then the importance of acknowledging social determinants and how this works into it, right? So really being deliberate about the conversations of, let's talk about how the larger society and the environment you live in and the neighborhood that you're in can really be uh, impacting the choices that you make and really allowing patients some space to talk about that and to acknowledge that and consider how that plays into it. Um, so studies for HAES in adults have been um, very positive. There have been some that are done in college students. So I'd say that's kind of the youngest age group that I've seen. And again, also showing some positive results. So I think we may start to see some adolescents, some work done with adolescents um, soon, or some of you out there might already know of this being done. Um, but they're, and they're really trying to make more robust methods, really looking at dose response, sort of what level of this intervention really makes the most difference, and, um, and also diversifying our outcomes where we really focus on well being and um, maybe metabolic health, cardiovascular health, and not necessarily the scale or the BMI chart. Uh, so one uh, book that we have been really interested in, and these are um, actually some local Bay Area folks, um, so a, tr a trio of um, Shelley Agarwal is a pediatrician, um, Signe Darpinian is uh, a mental health specialist, and Wendy Sterling is a dietitian. And so together they developed this book called No Way, and again, we're not we have no commercial interests in this. We've just um, really resonated with a lot of, of this. Kind of, it's kind of like a workbook. It's um, directly working for, um, with teens. Um, and actually their uh, direction started more from an eating disorder standpoint. So a lot of them actually specialize in eating disorder clinics. And so this can be used in all spectrums of you know, um, body diversity, but as a way to really focus on you know, the positives of eating, that eating is a wonderful, you know, practice, that it's a social and cultural practice, that it nourishes our body and can help us feel good. And so really starting to get into, you know, paying attention to those types of things, rather than always having this negative, I should be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that. So we developed a framework um, using a lot of these principles. I'm going to kind of skim through this just so that we can wrap up and talk a little bit about our intervention. But the idea really looking at different components of the school-based health center and how we can work together to be able to put some like, something like this into practice. So I'll explain a little bit about what we tried um, as one model, but we encourage you to think about how you can make this work uh, in your own clinic. Um, so the, the program, we called it Balance um, our, and Equilibrio in Spanish, so we made it a bilingual program. Um, and our goal, again, was to sort of implement some of these, uh, these ideas that we have uh, talked about in this presentation and really try to shift a little bit of the way that we have been um, uh, approaching uh, lifestyle and BMI conversations in the clinic. So our goal was to develop a program pilot. Um, so we're a large organization with many school-based health centers. We identified two where we could start, one middle school and one high school. And our goal was to um, enroll about 10 to 12 students in each place um, to go through the program. And our launch was aimed for January. Uh, we also wanted to hold trainings for all of our staff, both you know, from everywhere from medical providers to front office to you know, um, health ed and behavioral health to really try and again, bring all of these ideas to light and have a conversation and get everyone on the same page about what we think about this approach. Um, the intervention itself consisted of eight visits over this kind of like 12 week period. Um, so they had a medical visit at the very beginning and end, and that was where we did, you know, the, the medical stuff, right? We assessed past medical history and family history and review of systems and um, also did a little bit more probing into eating patterns. Um, try to evaluate for disordered eating. Um, if appropriate, we did things like labs and um, diagnostics, but it was not required. And we also did a little bit of education around um, stress and physiologic impacts of stress on weight. 
they had at some point in the, the course of the 12 weeks, they also had at least one behavioral health visit uh, with one of our behavioral health clinicians, so either a social worker or a psychologist. They did specific mental health and trauma screenings, um, so screening for things like depression, anxiety, and tra um, trauma. Uh, they also did a body image questionnaire um, that we took from the Adolescent Health Working Group. Um, they have a great website with a whole toolkit of, um, of uh, resources that you can use. Um, and then they could continue with behavioral health if I, needs were identified. Many of the students we en enrolled ended up already being, uh, you know, dialed into behavioral health, which was great. So they continued that support. And then finally, they had a curriculum with our health educators. And so they met, you know, uh, twice a month or so with health ed. And there was a five session um, you know, kind of lesson plan, so to speak, uh, where they would work together with the student on goal setting. And then they would talk about things like, you know, their food story, their relationship with food and their origins about feelings of food and weight. They would talk about mindful eating practices and, and do some exercises around that. They would practice things like the hunger and fullness scale, right? The idea of checking in with your body right before you eat and while you're eating of sort of like am I already full and just eating because something's in front of me? Or am I eating because I'm anxious or bored? Or right? So really trying to get into that sort of intuitive connection uh, with eating practices. Um, and then they also did, the health educator took them outside and did you know, some, some outside work, you know, maybe playing basketball or doing yoga or things like that to encourage you know, different types of movement. Um, and then overall, the idea was really around you know, kind of reinforcing body positivity and self-esteem and allowing the student to develop their own goals and supporting them in that. So then COVID happened. <laughs> so, you know, initially when we developed this, you know, submitted this abstract, we were really looking forward to being able to present all these great, you know, results of how it went. And, um, and unfortunately, we don't know. So, <laughs> so the overall um, idea is, you know, we started recruitment, we, we launched a little bit later than we had hoped. Um, we were able to recruit, you know, close to 12 between the middle and the high school. Um, some people got started, nobody had finished um, at the time that we closed. Uh, we were able to do some trainings, which was really great. So we did um, at our all staff retreat, we, I did individual trainings um, with our, you know, with some of our clinics and um, health ed providers. And uh, we actually even had the authors of No Way were scheduled to come to our all staff meeting on March 19th, and we had to, to cancel. So I know many of you have felt this pain and, and can relate to us. So um, yeah, so anyways, um, so just to summarize some challenges and successes, um, some of the challenges, so getting everybody on the same page was a little bit um, more time intensive than I had anticipated than we had thought about um, really, uh, you know, understandably this because this was a new phenomenon or a new idea for a lot of people. It took a little bit more of like, hey, let's take a step back. Let's talk. Let's really discuss things. So which was fantastic. It was a wonderful contribution to the process, um, but it did end up pushing our start date back. Um, the two sites that we chose were very different in their population, um, the payer mix, you know, billing, all of that. So really understanding how to roll it out differently in each site was more complicated than we had thought. Scheduling, you know, eight visits in three months is a lot when you're a really impacted clinic and um, don't have a lot of time as it is. So being able to make time um, for all of this was, was difficult. Even though we know that the research supports family involvement, we didn't at that, you know, in this round, we did not include a parent or family component. Our idea had been that as we progress to, you know, 2.0, that we would be able to work that in. So um, if we ever relaunch again, we may try and do that. Um, and then I have no data to present because it's all in a bunch of binders back at the clinic, which are collecting dust. So, um, so some successes, we did have some trainings that went well. The youth that we did start to work with were really interested and engaged and kept coming back and really, um, you know, just informally gave us good feedback about the fact that they appreciated talking about things in this way. Um, we did not have a budget. Uh, we didn't have any funding for this. So 
part of the planning and prep and all of that took longer because you know we were many of us were doing this kind of on the side as just our own sort of pet project. Um, we did have a little bit of you know some gift cards and things that we offered to kids to to help with incentivizing, but um, having more funding would have would have been great. Um, and then we also you know in asking these questions we got a lot of answers and we started to realize that maybe there had been a lot of you know disordered eating practices and social determinants that we had not necessarily been picking up before. And so this was I would say you know a, a success in that we realized that we really need to start asking these questions differently and probing for this information um, and a challenge in just considering like and what do we do now like. How do we really support these kids moving forward? Uh, COVID has impacted um, youth, particularly in the, in the context, uh, context of weight um, on a grand scale and also, you know, in our school-based health centers. So you may have seen there are a lot of studies out there looking at um, severity of COVID in both youth and adults with obesity. Um, it's, it's found to be worse. A lot of the theories right now are about the sort of pro-inflammatory state. So that obesity launches a lot of inflammatory processes in the body and that, that and then when you're dealing with a viral infection um, can be more complex. We also have all of the social issues that have come you know, to the forefront that have, have and become a lot worse with the economic situation with shelter in place. Um, so that has contributed. Um, so people are more stressed, they're stuck at home, they have less opportunities to go out or to move around. Uh, they may have fewer opportunities to go out and, and get healthier foods. So a lot of what we had been trying to, you know, to do is, is, is limited. And so um, doing this from telehealth is also complicated. Um, so many adolescents who felt comfortable coming into our office and having these conversations with us in a private setting are not necessarily feeling the same doing it on the phone or in a video chat. And so we don't have you know, all the answers for, for these things at this point, but I did wanna raise them as, and sort of acknowledge the fact that these are new challenges that we are now facing and, and are going to be trying to figure out sort of how to face. Um, okay, so just to summarize, and then we just have maybe like three minutes for some questions, but um, some take home points. So again, let's just rethink the way we intervene. Um, let's really con consider the impact of trauma and stress on weight. Let's consider a different outcome. Um, let's consider whether things like weighing our patients or you know how we've set up the clinical environment or the language we use might be in, impacting our patients negatively. And let's work to, together in the times of COVID and the pandemic to really figure out this, this, how to support youth within the new normal. Um, there were some questions about the Adolescent Health Working Group. Um, I can maybe, Haley, if you want to pose um, questions and Naomi can answer them and I can go ahead and grab a link that we could put into the chat. Wonderful, sounds good. So the next question we have is, how do we address billing when ICD-10 codes encourage labeling of BMI, obes obesity, et cetera? Are there other codes or documentation that can support without being stigmatizing? That is a great question. And I think that, you know, in the beginning of this project, we also felt that we couldn't, we could, you know, we couldn't avoid weigh, weighing people all together. Um, so, and I, you know, so I think in the long term, this is actually a discussion with the billers and the payers uh, about how to do that and what, how to actually how to identify youth. So I think what we uh, had come up with was that we had to measure, we had to weigh, we had to offer weight to youth at least once every three months, but we didn't have to do it every visit or, you know, maybe, maybe less often, but uh, we were not able to get away from it entirely in terms of billing. Um, and I don't know, in the, in the project, Victoria, did you actually come up with a different solution? Um, so it's a great question. So one of the things that we uncovered that I think was surprising to us is there had been um, a, a sort of uh, misunderstanding that weight measurements were required for billing. Um, and so there were a lot, of, there was a lot of resistance of providers of this idea of why aren't we weighing it every visit, thinking that billing, you know, many payers actually were requiring that. And they, they actually don't, not at the frequency which people thought. So um, you may need to do it, you know, once a year at a physical or things like that. But I would say, so I would suggest that you look into, you know, requirements of your insurers, certainly on a, a Medicaid standpoint, it's not required to do weight and height measurements. So that's just one piece of it. The other thing is that I have gone away from using the codes that say obesity and overweight. 
and I have gone to the ones that say BMI over 95%. Um, and again, even though I know there are problems with that, right, and I have issues with that, I do know that currently that is the clinical definition that is being used and that is being paid reimbursed for. So I am using it and on the sidelines trying to write in um, insight some change. So I think you know we're working on it, but I do think that at least the BMI makes it more of a clinical term. It, it destigmatizes a little bit of the language so that if a patient looks at their medical record, they're not seeing you know that word obesity or overweight, which can be so triggering. Um, that might be one, one option. 